interested in Montpelier's past, Montpelier's history. Um, the promotional material for this talk correctly says that I'll talk about how Montpelier's built environment, quote, responded to the natural environment and defined our community. As I thought more about this topic and the other programs that have been part of this PACE project, I realized that a good approach to this would be to explore the influences that rivers had on Montpelier's built environment. As such, the talk is sort of a meandering look at some of Montpelier's bridges and buildings along the rivers and elsewhere in the city. As some of you may have discovered, I distributed a history hunt in advance and uh, to try to generate some, uh, some on the ground engagement with our wonderful built environment and in this topic. I hope some of you had a chance to discover some new aspects of Montpelier's human-made landscape. And if you didn't, no worries, because I'll try to weave some of the answers to the history hunt questions as I look at four themes. I'm going to be looking at river crossings, i.e. bridges, the path of roads and railroads through the city, and finally the location of industrial buildings along the riverbanks. We are here because there are two rivers here, primarily the Winooski and the North Branch. Three, if you count the Dog River. These rivers attracted native peoples to this spot before European settlement. State archaeologist Jess Robinson, who knows more about this topic than I do, writes, quote, Montpelier's location along the Winooski River, near the mouths of the Dog River and the North Branch, meant that it likely served as a travel corridor for native peoples for at least 11,000 years. Beginning about 1000 AD, native people began to practice intensive agriculture in Vermont. The Winooski River floodplains became important areas upon which to grow crops. Although no archaeological sites directly attest to maize cultivation in Montpelier, early historic chronicles, I mean some of the books we've got, the history books, mention native cornfields and cleared lands in the general area." Unquote. As many of you are probably aware, Jacob Davis from Worcester County, Massachusetts is generally credited with being the first settler of European descent to build a permanent home here. Although a Canadian trader by the name of Joe Frizzell and his French wife were here when Davis arrived to survey the land, in 1786. Accounts are that Davis and his sons cleared the land where the city of Montpelier would eventually develop, suggesting that the land here had not been cultivated recently. Davis was also a proprietor of cows, but it was in Montpelier where he decided to build his cabin. Significantly, Davis and his sons built a sawmill and a gristmill on the North Branch, emphasizing the importance of the rivers to their calculation of the value of the land that we now call the city of Montpelier. This is the earliest known image of Montpelier, a woodcut by Sarah I. Watrous of 1821. You probably can tell why I have it here so early in the talk. It underscores the importance of the two principal rivers. You can see the north branch in the center of the image, and the mighty Winooski passing right to left. The State House is the most prominent building in the illustration, along with the church that I haven't figured out further to the left. <laughs> so there's the State House and the church, which actually may be the Episcopal Church, but I'm not sure because it was really down here and I'm not sure about the date. Um, the Washington Grammar School right there is at the head of Main Street, and then the Main Street Bridge and Dam are uh, right there at the foot of Main Street. This illustration is just 34 years after Jacob Davis first settled here, it was 1787, and only 13 years after the legislature first met in the new state house, which was built in 1808. Rivers are prominent in this view, the organizing feature of the village, if you will. Remember that this area was just a village of a much larger town of Montpelier. Montpelier and East Montpelier were not split until 1848. And remember that this view is also from Berlin, 
Montpelier would not have annexed a portion of Berlin until 1899. So this bank is Berlin. This bank. Although the natives and French used the Winooski for transportation, the Winooski doesn't seem to really figure in transportation needs of the, uh, the Europeans. We're focusing on the rivers of Montpelier tonight because their influence over the appearance of our city today. But I think we'll also recognize that we're not talking about rivers that are large and that have been used for, um, for transportation for, for many decades. The Winooski and Montpelier is relatively small as rivers go. It's not the Connecticut, it's not the White River. Um, so when human movement was mostly by land, it was an impediment to transportation rather than the means of transportation. This is the site of the primary crossing in the early years, what we now call the Main Street Bridge. In the 1790s until 1826, this was the site of numerous privately constructed bridges that kept getting washed away by ice and floods. In 1826, Sylvanus Baldwin designed this bridge that unlike its predecessors, had no supports resting in the water. So it was able to withstand ice flows and floods. The bridge, known as the Old Red Arch Bridge, lasted over 70 years on this site. This is the bridge that replaced it in 1898. It looks very similar to the Granite Street Bridge, which was built only four years later, and which we'll see in a moment. Notice the buildings facing the street at the left of the image. Those right there. We're going to come back to those toward the end of the talk. In the right center, right over there, is the E.W. Bailey Grist Mill. And the three-story building here is the home of the National Spring Clip Company, one of Montpelier's clothespin companies. It's no longer standing, but where Sarducci's is today. And you can see the dome of the State House sticking up right over the bridge. A familiar view today. It nicely sticks up over the Main Street Bridge today. Uh, although it has been gilded. This was pre-gilding of the, uh, the State House dome. Because this was in 1900. The dome wasn't gilded until 1907, I believe. And then this is a much grittier, grittier view of the same river crossing, perhaps taken in the 1920s, after the concrete E.W. Bailey grain elevators had been built. So here, these are the replacement grain elevators. These were quite a landmark on the um, skyline of Montpelier, if you will. They sort of created the skyline uh, along with the uh, State House Dome. Uh, these towers lasted in this uh, location until 1965. The bridge was replaced by a modern bridge in 1988, I believe. Someone may know a little better than I do. And the building on the right, which I already mentioned, um, was demolished in 1962 when Sarducci's building was moved into place. Sarducci's building actually started behind the uh, grain elevator. You can't see it. So just to recap in order, uh, 62, this building leaves. 65, this building is demolished. And then in 1988, the bridge is uh, taken down. And the uh, bridge that we're familiar with today was installed. 88 does seem late. So I may be a little off of that. Um, this is looking back again at that 1921 image, uh, enlarged a little bit. Because uh, it seems to me the second most important bridge in the city is probably the Rialto Bridge on State Street. I'm not exactly sure when the bridge was first constructed. It seems, but it seems to be in place when Sarah Watrous made this image in 1821. The bridge in this picture is conceivably the School Street Bridge but examination of late, later versions of this illustration convinces me that, in fact, is the bridge where the Rialto Bridge is located today. 
sort of a side note of interest, this particular illustration was used on several different Montpelier maps in the 19th century, but was revised each time to include new buildings and remove old ones. So they would change the state house, they would uh, add churches, um, and there's sort of uh, interesting illustrations that uh, give us a chance to study the changes in Montpelier's built environment. <laughs> Why was it called the Rialto Bridge, right? I'm not exactly sure why, but this is the Rialto Bridge in Venice, built in 1591. It's definitely arched, like the one in the Watchers Woodcut. The Venice version has shops on both sides, which ours definitely did not have at the beginning, and doesn't today. Um, but as you know, as you know, we do have shops on one side. It's not really as dramatic as that. So I'm not sure if that's the reason that it was called the Rialto, or maybe not. Uh, maybe the name represents the aspirations of the residents of the city of Montpelier to be more picturesque, like Italy. Although ho hopefully not more like Venice, with its water-filled canals. We try to avoid that here. Um, it's also interesting to uh, think about and note that our city hall is built in the Italian Renaissance style, and we have a bridge named after an Italian bridge. So maybe there was great aspirations that we were going to be the Italian hub of, uh, of Vermont. I don't know. Maybe someone else knows that can tell us later. So this is the result of a low point in Montpelier's history, the 1875 fires. I show you now because the Rialto Bridge is in the foreground. And it does not seem to have had buildings on the side of the bridge at that point. Um, so this is the Rialto Bridge here. This is Main Street right there. The corner of Barry and Main is right up there. Uh, and this is the building where um, the country store and Stairway to Style used to be located. That's uh, next to uh, Charlio's, the empty lot that's next to Char Charlio's. Burned in the 19, who remembers, 1990s, early 2000s, late 90s, I think. Um, so the fire missed that, uh, that building. Uh, in 1875, but unfortunately, an individual building fire uh, got it. Um, you can see someone installing wood there, new planks for the uh, for the bridge. And I don't honestly know if it was called the Rialto at this point or not. <laughs> but it was definitely called the Rialto by this point, uh, which was 1911. And as you can see, there was a building on the far side of the, of the bridge at that point. Uh, and the bridge is somewhat, the, the understructure of the bridge is somewhat arched. Uh, and maybe the, the top is a little bit. Uh, certainly nothing as dramatic as the uh, Rialto Bridge in Italy. Um, and unfortunately, that building is, uh, uh, was totally destroyed in 1911. But Montpelier persisted and uh, recovered from the 1875 fire, the 1911 fire, and indeed the 1927 flood. Uh, so this is actually the, uh, the current Rialto Bridge right here. Uh, it was built in 1915, so a few years after that fire, as was the building that's standing behind it. That's a new building as of 1915. The bridge is concrete and steel, famously survived the 1927 flood, as you can see. Look at the amount of debris that built up behind the, uh, the bridge. Uh, it's really remarkable, I think, that the bridge uh, survived. Uh, it's also remarkable how high the water was. If you look at that building right there, there's the water line. And right back here is the water line. So the 27 uh, flood was above the level of the uh, Rialto Bridge and uh, State Street, if you can believe. OK, I'm going to uh, take a slight side track away from the rivers and look at several, several of the photos 
several photos of buildings in downtown, especially those on the history hunt, which I just repeated a few months ago. So here's the first one uh, that I'm going to show you. Not the first one on your list. I'm going to mix these up just to uh, keep you all on your toes. Um, this is number four, if anyone's following along. It was James French's 1860s post office building, located right next to the river on the north side of the west end of the Rialto Bridge. And you can notice the railing right there. This is the same building, but in a little more context. Uh, so you can see a uh, bank, small bank building that sort of sat in the middle of Elm Street. Uh, seems a little remarkable to us today, uh, but that Elm Street intersection is wide, and there is now green space next to the uh, county courthouse. So uh, somehow they fit all that in. The maps show the roads going around either side of the, uh, the bank building. So <laughs> it, was, it definitely was in the middle of the road. <laughs> uh, and you can see the building here that we just looked at earlier. What's the date on this one? Uh, the date is probably around the same. It's, well, let's see. It's probably 1860. Well, late 1860s, probably about the same time as this one. Yes? Is that the weird looking right there between the uh, office there, the bank and the courthouse? Yep. Is it that section of lawn right there where they buried all the pianos? I don't right know. 27 I don't know. That's not a story that I had heard. Perhaps it is. Perhaps it is. <laughs> So in uh, 1869, so we go to before 1869, uh, James French sold this piece of property to James Langdon. As part of the deal, French had to move his building. James Langdon did not want that building there. So James French moved it to Main Street. And this is the picture of the building on Main Street. It's located basically where the uh, south end of the Blanchard block is now. Uh, there was also some changes made to the building in the process. Uh, notice, first of all, that the, uh, a stylish mansard roof was added. Uh, they also played around with the uh, front entrances. Uh, so those uh, windows were covered over or replaced with some uh, larger display windows. And then the two, um, the two front doors were still remaining in the same place. The building to the right, which you can barely see, I'm afraid, um, was a building that was located, that was moved or replaced by the uh, fire station in 1924. Um, this is another view of the Blanchard block. Uh, and you can see the French building right there. So uh, something that we often forget about the Blanchard block that was that it was really built in two pieces. Uh, so it is totally conceivable that the French post office was next to the Blanchard block and there's another building next to it that's where the fire station is today. Because this is just the beginning of the Blanchard block, 1883, and it was expanded in 1880. We'll have a chance to see, I think, as I recall, a larger view of the full-blown uh, Blanchard block in a few moments. So this is the 1883 Blanchard block with the French post office next to it. And this is James French's home on Main Street. As you can see, he had a thing for mansard roofs. Uh, there are certain similarities between this and the uh, building that he had right across, sort of right across the street, across and down the street, uh, the French post office building. Uh, so this James French, owner of this house, owner of the, of the uh, post office building, uh, is also the J same James French who built the building we now call the French Block, right across the street from the, uh, the post office, not across the street from there. Um, and E.P. Walton in Abby Hemingway's Vermont Historical Gazetteer writes, to him more than any one man, 
Montpelier owes the construction of its spacious and elegant stories. So he was quite an influential person in his time. Um, tend not to remember him, except we, uh, we honor him in the name of the French bloc. And by preserving this building, his little post office. So this is the answer to history hunt question number four. It is located uh, behind the fire station in, um, I guess, what's called Pitkin, Pitkin Court. Um, oddly, somewhat oddly, the building is sitting sideways. This is the front of the building. So this is the traditional front. Uh, you can see it's got the fancier windows. A couple of those windows have been removed. They're now just two. Um, and this was the side. It's got the square windows. The river would have been flowing right next to this building here. This is an, a modern addition, which is, I think, pretty uh, sympathetic to the, uh, to the original building. Um, an interesting fun fact that some of the older people in the audience may remember is that in the 1970s, when a booklet pamphlet called A Walk Through Montpelier was published, this was Polini's Garage. And yes, it was a auto repair garage uh, in this beautiful building. Uh, it sort of um, staggers the mind to think about it, but it was, it's been uh, rehabilitated and uh, looks beautiful now. So let's just see. That's, so that's the front that I was talking about right here. Uh, many more of those arched windows, a lot of ornamentation, a lot of decoration. That is the side of the building that now faces the front, uh, which is sort of the parking lot. But yeah. Well, if we had you, how they move that over the bridge? Hold on to that question. <laughs> I've been wondering the same question. I was hoping that you could answer that for me, Sandal. Can I ask you to go back? One, sure. To, to, to the old picture again. Just because in, in, behind it, notice that hill and that there's almost no trees. Yes, that. yes, yeah. that's true. So some of the other programs in the place program have been about the uh, regrowth of the, uh, the hill. Um, and I'm not quite sure the, the time frame, how long it took to grow up. Uh, some of you may remember from the talk, but we'll see a uh, couple more pictures that, that show that hill. A uh, much better view of that hill than what you get today. Uh, I thought you were going to say behind it were a lot of other buildings, which is something that we will uh, explore in a few moments. What about the staircase? I think it goes down to the, uh, yeah, it sort of somehow goes down to the river. Uh, lower entrances? I don't know. There was, um, you know, there was uh, talks about a, a river walk of Montpelier back in the 1970s. There was a book called, um, uh, well, the Montpelier workbook or something, and uh, they, they envisioned a, a walk that was sort of suspended behind there, but there's obvious problems with uh, <laughs> and impeding the flow of the river, which uh, we don't want to do. Paul, there's a picture in the on the second floor of the state house, right after the state house was built, which was 1859, and there are no trees behind the state house, no. or very few. I think you two have seen my talk already. <laughs> we'll see that too, I think. Well, one of them. Uh, that, uh, that's right. Um, so, before we get to the hill behind the state house, um, I just wanted to um, stick, stay downtown for a moment uh, and look at this building. Uh, this was number one on your history hunt. Uh, I'd say this was maybe the toughest uh, picture because it's so up close. I don't know if anyone discovered where this was, obviously downtown. One here. Uh, so to me, the clue is the brick pattern up here. Um, and I gave a hint about where this building was a few months ago. I don't know if anyone caught it. No? It's in the French block. So that was a creation of James French. This is the French block of 1875. No, notice anything about that date? 1875? Yeah, the date of the fire. Uh, so this was built right after the fire. 
And our friend E.P. Walton, again from Hemingway's Vermont Historical Gazetteer, wrote, never was more energy displayed than in the rebuilding of the burned districts, the smoke having barely cleared away when several large and splendid brick blocks were underway in the course of erection. Some of them occupied within four months. Four months? And I don't know, that sounds rather ambitious. Uh, but so, yes, so this is located somewhere in the French block. It's the paint center. It's the paint center, that's right, Jen here in front. So right there is the same uh, brick. Um, this is the only place in the building where there are three windows over the string course of granite. Um, and so yes, that's the answer to number one. And this is a larger view of uh, the French block in 1937. So you can see that this is the only place with <laughs> three. You think the building is symmetrical, right? No, it's not. Um, this is not the center of the building. It goes from here down to here. Um, and the space we're looking at is right here. Um, I did um, want to point out that there were some, uh, there was a lot more brickwork uh, in the building originally than has survived. Well, the number on the window. The number on the window is another. Four which, two. Where is it? It's by his head. By his head? Yeah, his I head? can't see it there, but I saw it. Uh, it's by his shoulder. shoulder. Oh, right, right there. And the same number. Yeah, yeah. good, that's another clue. <laughs> You don't have to analyze the architecture. And there are other clues. I mean, truth be known, there are directories of yes. monthly businesses, and one can look that up. But you guys didn't have access to that, although you may have. I don't know if you could have told the 22 on your, or 42 on, uh, on your sheets. Um, so that storefront, I believe, changed when First National Stores uh, built their store. Um, notice the, uh, the swinging window, the swinging doors there, the double doors, and the, uh, the display windows are now large plate glass windows. Um, I'll bring back the picture of uh, Obushans. Mm -hmm. So those doors are pretty similar to the doors that uh, they put in there in the 30s. Um, I think the uh, plate glass now is two panes rather than one huge pane. That was probably quite a maintenance issue for the, uh, the First National stores. And uh, of course, this space was also the space occupied by Summers Hardware that a lot of us remember. And uh, they, you know, they had the same doors too. Uh, you can see they uh, filled in some of this lower area here with uh, this stonework and they simplified, unfortunately, uh, the brickwork on the side compared to, there's the uh, historic 1913. I used to be able to get down into the cellar. And uh, there was the uh, ornamentation there. And of course, that there is all done. So a very beautiful, uh, small store in downtown Montpelier. Small, but full of, uh, full of goods. I'm going to move now over to uh, State Street. And this is the building that James Langdon wanted to build and why he told James French to move his little post office out of there. Uh, so this was number two on the, on the history hunt. Uh, we're getting back to the bridge a little bit. That same uh, railing is still over there. I don't know if you can see it just past the, uh, uh, that wagon. Uh, and this building is still standing today. Right? Right. Mm -hmm. This is the building in uh, 1927. Uh, and you notice a new mansard roof on this building. Keep it, keep it stylish. Um, and um, they also, uh, one, one entrance has been removed. The, the other entrances are here. Um, I think the, uh, the entrances sort of attest to the size of uh, stores in Montpelier at this point. Uh, there are five entrances along this building. Uh, so, and each of those are presumably a, a different store. 
Um, so you had fairly small stores back in the, that day. And this is the building in 1930, looking very much as it does today, 92 years later. Um, you can see that around the post-flood period, they uh, added the marble facade, which makes it look much fancier. And it's appropriate for the bank that was here, the Capital Savings Bank and Trust. You want to build trust in your patrons. And uh, so this shows uh, the solidity of the, of the building. Um, also, it's worth noting the uh, small wood frame building behind the bank right here. Uh, that obviously is no longer with us. Uh, you can see a little bit of uh, one of the uh, Langen Street, see one of the Langen Street buildings there. And uh, State Street was a, a cement, uh, cement highway at that point. And they, they managed to fit in a lot of cars on the street too, didn't they? <laughs> no parking in front of there now. Okay, one more history hunt. Number three on your sheets. Uh, did you figure out where this building was located? Yeah. Can you look around? Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, where is this? Where are these buildings now? I mean, not today. Where were, Where was this in 1880 when the photographer took it? Does anyone know? Upper Main. Upper Main. No. That building right there next door, it looks like a brick building. This Should one? Top? Yeah. yeah that's no, that's a, uh, well. It's gone. There's a building just like it right there. That's right. Yeah. This is, maybe this looks a little more familiar. Yeah. <laughs> that is Langdon Street. And this is the entrance to Langdon Street. Mr. Langdon took down this building, although it looks very similar to the Cool Jewels building, which is on the other side of State Street. Uh, the book where uh, Rivendell Books was, the, the building where Rivendell Books was, is right there and right here. And of course, uh, Onion River Sports and Outdoors was down there on Langdon Street. Uh, and this was the um, this was a bank on the corner. You can't quite see it beyond the center of the building. Uh, it used to be the Montpelier Savings Bank. We're doing a mini tour of uh, Montpelier Banks here. Uh, later, the Howard Bank, now TD Bank. Um, this is looking in a different direction, and I didn't bring this up because I couldn't find the picture I wanted to use uh, showing the uh, uh, Montpelier Savings Bank in its heyday. Because that same booklet published in 1974, Walk Through Montpelier, says, and I quote, Mr. Landon's ambitious intentions to create a planned shopping area were only partially fulfilled. The Howard Bank, a focal point of downtown Montpelier, remains a busy corner in the city's commercial life. But Langdon Street is today a relatively quiet byway with little traffic. <laughs> Things have changed, haven't they? Anyone gone by the Howard Bank or the uh, TD Bank recently? It's a little sad on that corner, but um, Langdon Street is bustling, so us hustling. Um, and if you just want to look at this uh, for a moment, this is the 1930s since I brought it up. Uh, so here's the uh, here's the second half of the uh, Blanchard Block that I was talking about. And uh, you can't see it here, but the um, the uh, fire station had been built by that point. The fire station was built in 1924, so you can see the skirt there on the uh, the outside. Um, so that's just looking at the, the hustle and bustle of Main Street in the 1930s, and I guess in the 1970s too. I don't have a picture from the 1970s. But I digress. The question was, where was the building uh, that we looked at was blocking Langdon Street? And here it is. Same building, now on Langdon Street. So Mr. Langdon didn't waste any resources. He moved the building across the river, um, and there, of course, there is a bridge there now. Um, but I've always wondered, what the woman in the front was wondering, was how did these buildings get across the rivers? 
Um, this one was the one that came to mind first, but of course, uh, as was pointed out, the small post office building had to be moved also. Um, there are no photographs of our buildings being moved. Uh, this one is down from Bellows Falls, uh, but it might give you an idea of how they conceivably could have moved it. Uh, a lot of cribbing <laughs> underneath the, uh, underneath the uh, building. Um, and the only thing that I can think of is that they must have moved the building, uh, the Sweet Melissa's building, if you will, uh, across the North Branch and then built the, uh, the bridge. I would doubt that the bridge could hold the weight of a uh, building. Maybe it could have, uh, but the weight, but the, those bridges were, uh, were trestle bridges, uh, so it wouldn't have been flat. I think they must have done something along these lines. Uh, it's also interesting to know that the um, post office building and this building were moved 20 years apart, as far as I can tell. So they had um, they had a lot of time to figure out their uh, their techniques and the uh, the engineering involved. Did they use mule horses, trucks? What did they use to pull them? Well, probably uh, probably animals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, oxen, oxen or, or horses. Um, who was it moved? Uh, a building in the old way uh, that got some newspaper attention recently. Um, old uh, Old Stone House Museum uh, up in Brownington, um, and they had several teams of um, of oxen uh, pulling one of the buildings. They were rearranging the buildings on the historic site. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how they cre created the locomotion, but it must have been with uh, with some sort of piece of. I watched, I, I, I watched a, a building being moved recently, like in the last 15 years, and even though they were using bulldozers and stuff, they were using pulleys. So they would, because they, the, the force, there was more force than direct pulling if you put a pulley in. Okay, the okay, so, so using still, basic rules of physics yep. to uh, yep. block and tackle sort of thing. Yep. yep. Great. Is it possible to move brick buildings? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Or did they fall apart? So, uh, I think so, yeah. Some yeah. of the uh, historic preservationists in the room might be able to tell us, but um, yeah, I think I think brick buildings have been moved. Good. Just this last year, they moved a brick building, a little railroad station, and a yeah. hostel at Fairhaven, mm -hmm. moved up the hill. And, you know, okay, I don't know if you can hear that or not, but the um, Paul Kate from the front is saying that uh, recently they moved a, uh, a brick building in Fairhaven or? Yeah. Right down near where Route 7 comes. Down where Route 7, right, right, the okay. Station. Yep, the railroad station, yep, I remember that. So yes, it is possible. Well, that, that's yeah, a huge... That was a local guy here. Yeah. Yes, there is a, 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 a mess here, yep, yep. Okay, so that's possibly how those buildings moved across. I don't have a picture of the uh, of the first Langdon Street Bridge, uh, except I do have a picture of the first Langdon Street Bridge. <laughs> there it is. It unfortunately was a victim of the 1927 flood. Uh, this is a detail of the picture I showed you earlier uh, to show you the uh, Rialto Bridge and the Rialto Building behind it. I do think this is a uh, fascinating uh, picture to look at. They've got a ladder coming down here. No OSHA rules at that point. And there's some sort of mechanical winch device up here at the top. They've removed some of the sections of the railing. And they are, there's a guy standing down here, a man standing down here. Oh, yeah. And I believe they are trying to raise the, uh, the bridge out of the water, the iron. They're not going to reuse the bridge, but um, and trying to clear that, that massive uh, pile of rubble. Um, the amount of uh, rubble that they had to move after the 27 flood is just uh, astounding, and that may uh, give some credence to the idea that they buried uh, pianos in the um, front of the courthouse. So this is the bridge that replaced the uh, Langdon Street Bridge after 1927. This photo was about 1940. Uh, for those of you who are interested in bridge styles, this is called a Warren Pony Truss, I am told. Uh, and the bridge that is there today looks very much like that, but some of you with 
good memories. We'll remember that this that the bridge that's today is a replica of this building, of this bridge. Uh, it's not the exact same bridge. This is Langdon Street. So this is standing on the Rialto Bridge, looking up upstream to the lake. Right. This is the building where uh, Sweet Melissa's used to be. Now Rusty Nails or something like that. Bed nails, bed nails, yes. Uh, there's a little closer view. Um, you can see that the riverbank is filled with uh, buildings, and this was actually a, uh, a gas station. Richards and Parolini. There you go. Excellent. What are the buildings like? Some of them, or, or a little. Um, or little mechanics buildings, little small industries. We'll see a better picture of them in a moment. Uh, that's just today. If you need a reminder, uh, the gas station is on the garden back. OK, I'm going to look at a different uh, river crossing uh, right here. River crossing of the, uh, we're back on the Winooski. Uh, this is maybe, you might argue, the third most important crossing uh, in town, the Taylor Street Bridge. Uh, this bridge served as a bypass to the Main Street Bridge and brought people directly into the State Street area without going through what I assume was a busy state and main even in those days. Um, and as you'll see, there were uh, industrial buildings along the south side of the river, so this bridge also had the uh, benefit of providing access to those, uh, those industrial buildings as well. I don't have actually a chronology on the um, when the river crossings in Montpelier were, were constructed, but I suspect that this was a very early uh, early crossing, and it's a project that uh, some of us should undertake to figure out when the bridges were uh, were built, or when the first bridges, when the first crossings were made. I thought we'd take a look at this uh, picture in a little more detail. Uh, it's really great fun to be able to have um, these historic photos enlarged on this big screen where, where everyone can see it and where we can point out things. Um, the, first thing, oh, the first thing I would like to point out is just the general overall density of the scene. Um, so you've got lots of buildings uh, sort of cheap to jowl. Um, you don't have the big open areas that we have now for, uh, for parking lots, unfortunately. Uh, you've got gardens behind people's houses. You have a lot more wood frame buildings. Uh, you can see this is the uh, building where the, uh, the thrush, now Capitol Foe, is. It's been pushed back, uh, but that's the same building. Could you pull out so that they can see the Capitol? Uh, no, but I've got other areas where you can see the Catholic, I've got another shot where you can see the Catholic Church. Um, but I will show you another church that's not there, which is sort of interests me. I don't know if you can see that the contrast isn't too good, but that's a, um, that's not a building across the street, that's a square tower. Uh, that's the second congregational church that was organized in 1835. I had a very short lifespan. It dissolved in 1849, 48, so uh, not even 20 years. Uh, it was taken over by another church, which in 1853 is identified as the Free Church. And then by 1859, it's uh, called Capitol Hall. So it's the seat of the newly independent town government. Montpelier was organized until, as a city until 1895. So in 1870 here, or in 1859, uh, uh, it's not City Hall, it's sort of a town hall for, uh, for Montpelier. Uh, this building over here no longer stands. That's the, uh, the first Methodist church. I don't have the dates for it, unfortunately, but uh, of course the uh, Methodist church you know is a much larger brick uh, building on Mainton Street next to the Calicum Library. Not the same location, no. There's a very, um, uh, there's a three-story brick, fairly forgettable building on the corner there. It's the corner of Court Street and uh, Elm Street and, well, I guess Court, no, yeah. Uh, would have been right around there because there's an older house that's uh, still standing that would have been next to it. So it's, uh, it's right where that brick uh, building. Some of the um, uh, law offices have been in there, other things. That's the Dewey, um, 
the Dewey Schoolhouse that's still standing. Uh, this is the building that was taken down for the uh, uh, various versions of hotels. Uh, the Capitol Plaza is there today. Uh, this is a building that became the, uh, the YMCA. We'll see that in a different view, so I wanted to point that out now. And this is the Episcopal Church down at the end. Um, it had a, um, a full steeple um, at that point. Since we are, I, I will back up. Um, and that's the uh, Catholic Church. Since we're talking about churches, house, and the State House is over here. Yeah. And this building, of course, is still standing, owned by the state now. And um, these are the rail lines right there. There's one rail bed starting to uh, come into, uh, into view. We'll be talking about railroads uh, in a few minutes, if you all uh, bear with me. Uh, so I'm going to look at another of the uh, history hunt questions. This is number eight. And by context, you probably know where this is. Yeah. Where is it? I was hoping you would say that, Fred. But you haven't been paying attention. We've been talking about Taylor Street. Yeah. This is the Taylor Street Bridge. That's the greatest street bridge. It was a trick. It was a trick. <laughs> uh, so the greatest street bridge is actually older. Uh, this is the uh, this is the Taylor Street Bridge. Uh, it was. Um, built after the 27th flood, because the 27th flood took out the, uh, the wooden uh, covered bridge. Uh, and this, as um, Fred was noting, is the Granite Street Bridge, which is actually older. It was actually 1902, uh, and it was, you know, although it looks rather fragile, doesn't it? Uh, it uh, withstood the, uh, the 27th flood, uh, probably because the flood wasn't as strong here. And we'll see a map of the 27th flood toward the end, and we'll um, have a chance to uh, try out that theory. This is when it was being rehabilitated in the, uh, in the 1990s. Uh, for those of you, uh, if you want to know how to tell the difference, this has got a flat top, um, and it is called a Baltimore through truss bridge, and the um, Taylor Street Bridge is slightly arched top, and it is called a Parker through truss. I want to go back to that photo and zoom out a little bit to give you a little more context and to show you the, uh, the buildings on the banks of the river, which I think are pretty remarkable. Uh, sort of industrial buildings on the south side, railroad buildings on the north. Here's the full view, um, which is a beautiful, uh, beautiful view of the, the city, sort of a uh, gritty view, but a beautiful one. Um, I think it's really remarkable how the um, uh, National Life Building from the 1920s stands out there. Uh, look how big it is uh, compared to all the residential buildings that were around and how white it is. Uh, it's really picking up the light. It was brand new um, about this time, so it would have been at its most pristine. Uh, and the sun is also catching the, um, uh, the dome of the State House. Uh, you can see there's a lot of activity back here. Uh, there's sort of a car dealership. There's sort of a lot of glare on that screen, isn't there? But uh, there are car repair places here. Oh, that's good. Perfect, yeah. You want to dim it even more? Oh. Oh. Yeah, let's leave those off. Sorry, Gilbert. So look at the, uh, the lumber here on the side, uh, car repair places. These are buildings serving the railroad. Uh, this is the building at the uh, the extension of the YMCA building. Uh, this is the building where the T.W. Wood Gallery was located. Uh, and those are skylights to uh, to highlight the uh, the art. You know, art is best presented in natural light. Um, and the uh, the railroad station will the railroad station will see that in a moment. It is uh, right uh, nestled in there. Um, and the. Uh, Catholic Church is gone by this point, uh, but we'll get to see it in a uh, in a moment. The railroad bridge is down there on the river too, still there today. And the railroad bridge, yes. And I wanted to point out, thank you. I wanted to point out the uh, the confluence of the uh, North Branch and the uh, New Ski. So this is sort of the, the heart of the matter here. 
Okay, going back in time a bit. This is not a chronological time talk. Uh, this is 1860, 1876 or 1874. There's a little bit of a uh, discussion about what that is, but uh, there's the Bear Hill that someone was uh, was mentioning. This is a uh, very popular photograph, a photograph that's used a lot when talking about Montpelier. Uh, I'm using it to show the uh, the railroads. Um, they're so shown here, both crossing and following the uh, the rivers. Um, rivers aren't just something to cross; they're also the path of land transportation, especially roads and rails. What path did railroads take to get here? Path of least resistance, right? Which was usually the river, rivers, banks. The railroad is shown here, following both following and crossing the river. Uh, I say that railroads usually followed the rivers, but there were geographic and political exceptions to the demands of, uh, of engineering. And in this case, uh, there was a political um, exception, uh, which was Charles Payne, who was president of the Central Vermont Railroad and was from Northfield. So he built his railroad bypassing both Barrie and Montpelier, which would have been a logical place to put it, and instead going through Northfield, because he wanted to bring business, of course, to his hometown. So this created a uh, somewhat confusing railroad situation in Montpelier, at least in my mind. Um, I've always wondered why uh, we have to get on the Amtrak station at Montpelier Junction, not in downtown Montpelier. Well, that's where the rail line has always been. Um, railroads were important to Montpelier, uh, but it's always been a spur line uh, from the central Vermont into Montpelier and then later on to Barrie. Um, and there were two railroads in Montpelier. Uh, one is the central Vermont coming in here, and then the other was the uh, Montpelier and Wells River going out that direction. This map is probably a little hard to see and interpret, uh, but the point is that there was a lot of railroad tracks and granite companies along the river in Montpelier in 1915. Some of you in the front might be able to read this, read this map, but these are uh, granite sheds all along here, all along here. Uh, these are railroad buildings in here. The freight depot is up there. This is Berry Street going along there. So quite. Quite a lot of activity. This is a, uh, a view in the same area, all the uh, tracks going through Montpelier on what is now called Stonecutter's Way. Uh, this building, of course, still stands. Uh, it's the location of the uh, Skinner, Fox, and Brigham uh, law office, other offices. Uh, these buildings have been replaced by, uh, by modern buildings. Well, do you have a sense of whether Montpelier? Uh, was more of a working man, working person in this town for a good while. I mean, when we think of this Certainly today, right. Certainly more today. And I was going to make that point when we talk about uh, more than today. Um, I was going to make that point when we um, uh, talk a little bit about industry. But um, so, yeah, you've been uh, you've been previewing the, uh, the talk. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, those granite sheds brought brought a lot of uh, working class people to uh, come up here. Yes. When you think of Barry as classically having been that, you know, over yep. the centuries, yep. and yep. I guess I didn't tend to think of Montpelier. Montpelier had, as I will mention in a moment again, um, Montpelier did have a uh, significant Italian and uh, Spanish um, population. Um, to work in the grand sheds and along the railroads. Yes. There is a railroad turnstile. Yep. Yep. Turntable. Yep. Turntable on way. Yep. So you can't really see that. That's right about in there. That was part of the. Uh, so you know they had to move the engines around and the rolling stock around and um, needed to, to turn vehicles, needed to turn trains, and they they would store them along. Um, uh, in sheds along here. 
So let's uh, let's finish up with the railroads, and then we'll get to uh, eventually we'll get to uh, the granite industry just very briefly. Uh, but I just wanted to show you uh, that since we had two rail lines, we had two railroad stations, um, and this is the uh, one for the uh, Central Vermont station which was across from the pavilion building, which was a very strategic place to be, uh, both for the railroad and for the pavilion. Uh, people could come visit Montpelier and uh, stay across the street at the pavilion. Of course, they would get off the train, walk, walk out toward the street, and see the, uh, the state house right there in front of them, which must have been a very, uh, very impressive, uh, impressive view. Uh, this building was torn down in the 1960s, um, and the front area, I mean, sort of the parking lot now, uh, the front area is now located, is now occupied by that big uh, People's Now M&T Bank slash State of Vermont uh, office. And this is the other railroad station that is still standing. Uh, this was for the Montpelier and Wells River. Um, and uh, that, of course, is on Main Street now with, yes, another bank. Uh, <laughs> another bank in it. Banks seem to occupy uh, downtown buildings Okay, I'm going to move away from railroads and talk a little bit about um, roads because roads took a similar route following the, um, the uh, river. Uh, so this is Montpelier 1854 and Montpelier 1889. Uh, so this is from the State House. I don't know if it was the um, the uh, view that people were, that someone was mentioning earlier. Uh, but you can see that um, 45 years earlier, uh, we've got the carriage coming in here along Route 2. We have uh, the second state house. This building is, uh, was an early version of the pavilion building and sort of generalized landscape. Uh, this building right here is very interesting. It's where the uh, credit union is today. Uh, and you can see it a little stronger right here. That was a, uh, that was a James Langdon brick house. This is still Berlin, okay? So he lived in Berlin, worked in Montpelier, built in Montpelier. Um, and then later passed down through his uh, daughter, uh, became the uh, Nicholas Manor. Uh, this area was known as Langdon Meadow right here. Um, and um, what else do I notice about this? What I notice is the uh, sort of the very strong pastoral feeling, um, the sense of the approach, the general uh, gradual approach to the State House along Route 2. Uh, you must have been able to see the State House uh, looming up ahead as you uh, traveled along the, uh, the road from, uh, from Berlin. Uh, also, this one shows the uh, uh, Vermont College up here on the, the hill, which I think is a rather nice touch. This is James Gilman, 1889. Uh, if you go into the uh, State House in the card room, you'll see this painting and other versions that, uh, that Gilman uh, painted. Uh, very fun to look at. Yes? I noticed in some of your pictures that the State House roof keeps changing. Is that the color? Yes, and that's because I'm not giving that's I'm not giving you a chronological talk. Uh, so it changed once. Uh, so it's 1907. It was gilded. Uh, so when it was first built, uh, this building was 1859. Uh, it was that red copper uh, sort of uh, coverage, and then um, it was gilded in 1907, probably to keep up with the, the style of the times. Uh, there are people here who know more about it than I, but. Um, government buildings were starting to be gilded and um, became a little, a little glitzy. Well, it's the <laughs> Italian thing. And the Italian it's thing, like, too. Right. To add to your Italian thing, the roof was originally red because it was to look like the red roofs in Italy. Ah, so we do have an Italian theme going here. <laughs> Someone's going to have to study that a little bit. OK, this is, uh, this is Lower State Street. Uh, this is where the big impressive houses were located. Uh, we sort of forget about it now because these are all apartment houses or they've been converted into offices. 
we sort of drive by them on our way to somewhere else. But this is the way that people would have come into the city. They would have proceeded by these uh, somewhat grand, large houses as they approached the center of government and then eventually the, uh, the commercial areas. Uh, notice the large elms here that uh, really added, I think, to that, uh, that sense of gentility uh, on State Street. This is much, much later, 1939. Uh, but the main entrance to the city of Montpelier is still Route 2. Uh, it may be a little deceptive because this is so high up in the air, but this is just a little dirt road over here. This is Langdon Meadow. Uh, the Nicholas Manor or the Langdon House is gone. Uh, there are sports fields here. Um, this was called Winooski Drive. Uh, Langdon Meadow became known as National Life Field. Uh, I'm not sure exactly the timing on that. Um, but uh, this is it a little later, the 1950s. You can see that it was a um, really a recreation area for the, for the city. These are um, tennis courts. Uh, you can see a baseball diamond here. And then there are uh, stripes for a uh, football gridiron, I believe. And I think I've seen uh, sort of uh, putting uh, golf type uh, activities and pictures on this. There's some, uh, some small buildings along here. And uh, the railroad tracks, of course, come in. But the main entrance is right here along Route 2. I want to go back one moment to this picture uh, because it relates to some of the other programs in the PLACE program. That is the talks at um, Hubbard Park. You'll see here the uh, what were called the plantations of, what were they, white pines? Red pines. Red pines. Norway spruce. Norway spruce. A whole bunch of things. So there's the tower, and there's those spots of um, pines that they were, were planting. Uh, looks like a big city from the from the air, doesn't it? And of course, National Life owned all not only the field here, but they owned uh, that whole mountainside, which would eventually become the home of their their corporate offices. Uh, one thing to note here is that there is no way across the river here except down at the Taylor Street Bridge. There was no, bail, no street at Bailey. Uh, there were occasionally temporary bridges, such as this one. Uh, 1911, they celebrated Labor Day in a big way. Uh, certainly a lot bigger than we celebrate it today. Uh, there were all sorts of contests. I think, as I recall, there were some uh, fire department contests, which were a big deal and so hose pulling contests and things like that. So these people were going across this bridge over to uh, Langdon Meadow for, uh, for the activities of the day. Pretty impressive that that bridge uh, held up over the <laughs> So what happened in 1956? The city bought uh, Bought, acquired the uh, National Life Field, or the National Life gave it to them. Uh, I don't know what the financial transaction was there, but the uh, the city's high school was built there in 1956. Now you still had to get there uh, on Newski Avenue, that dirt road, uh, which was still a minor road. Before I explain that, I just wanted to look at the uh, building a little closer. Um, I think you can see it was designed. Uh, in a period when evidently people thought that uh, schools should look like factories. Um, <laughs> definitely has an industrial look to it. Um, but although this high school was built in an out-of-way location, uh, it was done so with the full knowledge that things were about to change. And indeed they did. In 1958, um, the uh, so-called Montpelier Bypass Bridge was built, also known as Bailey Avenue Extension. On the right is uh, the mayor of Montpelier, Edward Knapp, same gentleman for whom the uh, airfield in Berlin is named. He was uh, actually a state uh, employee who uh, advocated uh, and helped build the state's uh, aeronautic infrastructure. And the gentleman on the left any old timers recognize who that was? Bob yes. Bannon. What's that? Bob Bannon. That's Bob Bannon. Oh, no. Radio reporter. Um, WSKI maybe? Yes. 
Uh, do you know anything, do you notice anything about the uh, buildings over here? They're different and they're the same. So this building uh, is still there. Uh, this building is uh, gone. Uh, interestingly, it was the home of a previous Montpelier mayor, George Blanchard. It was sold to none other than National Life in 1956, and then to the First Church of Christ Scientists uh, the following year. And then it was removed for the uh, Christian Science Building in 1971. Um, also, just to uh, finish a couple of uh, couple of circles, George Blanchard was the president of the National Spring Clip Company, whose building we saw downtown next to the uh, Red Arch Bridge. Red Arch Bridge a few slides ago. And while the high school is building, being built, while that, while, while that bridge was being built, this was going on also. Uh, and I show you just to underscore the point that um, both roads and rails uh, followed the river. This is, of course, the construction of Interstate 89. I'm not sure exactly where it is. It's somewhere between Waterbury and Montpelier. I initially thought it was Middlesex, uh, but I'm not entirely sure that that is right. Um, I'm going to say yes. Paul. You're going to see yes. Someone from Montpelier says, or from Middlesex says yes. It is. You can see this is Room Two. Uh, I believe what's happening is that they're maybe creating a new space for Room Two here because they're putting the uh, interstate right through there, and then Room Two would continue on. So do you think that's the settlement farm area? Um, it's uh, we're a little closer to Mount Pillar than the settlement farm. You can see where Route 2 goes over. It's right where it goes over now where that bridge was replaced yep. a few years yep. ago by okay. kind of Lower Barnett Hill yep. Um, yep. in that area. And then you get on the straightaway and the settlement farm will be a little bit to your right where the room is right now. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there. Yep. Okay, good. So it is Montpelier. Uh, but you can see the um, what a massive undertaking it was to build the interstate. Really uh, quite an engineering feat. I want to throw this in here because um, it is Montpelier again. This is an opening of a section of the interstate in on November 19th, 1970. So this is November 9th, November 19th, 52 years ago. Uh, rather bleak affair. Um, it was raining pretty hard, it looks like. Um, this was the opening of the section from um, Montpelier south to Bethel. Uh, this is Dean Davis, the governor, uh, and the Montpelier president, former president of uh, National Life. National Life figures very prominently in the history of Montpelier, uh, probably the topic for a whole other talk. Um, and these are the cars lined up here. Uh, the governor's uh, Lincoln Town car parked right there. They had a band over there. It was uh, quite, quite an event. So the section north from Montpelier, this one, had opened 10 years earlier uh, in 1960. This is 1970. And I was just going to mention that um, it's important when studying Vermont history uh, in this era, in the era of the interstates, to remember that the interstate did not open up all at once, okay? It was very gradual and incremental. And um, this shows that if you were to drive from Montpelier to Burlington in 1962, let's say, you could get up to here, Waterbury, but then you had to drive on Route 2, undoubtedly, until you got to Burlington. And then later, 63 and 62, this piece was open, but it wasn't, the final piece there between Montpelier and uh, Burlington wasn't open until uh, 64. And you can see, say, you can see similar things going on uh, down here. If you were going from White River to Montpelier in the late 60s, you could drive on the highway, but then you had to jump off uh, at Bethel and uh, drive on the, uh, the earlier roads. Okay, so a little lesson about uh, the arrival of the interstate. Um, the interstate obviously redirected traffic and changed the built environment in profound ways, most of which I don't have time to address here. But I wanted to take a look at one overlooked category of buildings that was influenced by the interstate and by other roads, uh, and that is gas stations. Two of gas stations are on your history book. Uh, this is number 11 on the handout. 
Uh, this was known as Berganti's Filling Station, and the photo is from 1926. Did you figure out where this is? Aries. Yes. Aries. Great. Another trick question. You fell for that one too. No. Parker's Quick Stop. Parker's Quick Stop. Yes. There is Parker's. So, it doesn't look a whole lot like, but notice the uh, placement of the front door and the windows. And this corner right here. The pitch roof. Yeah. Pitch roof. This, uh, this photograph is a little misleading. This is not on top of this Sacconi uh, overhang. That's the building behind it. And if you look, there's that same building. And also, look at the, uh, the gas pumps here in the front. What do you see right in the front? Right there are some of the uh, filling tanks that I think were right where those tank, where those pumps were before. Uh, this whole uh, this whole section has been torn down. Uh, you know, a lot of changes, but I believe that that is the same building. Interesting. The city assessor's database says that this is a 1950s building. I don't think so. Um, and you're right, it looks very much like Perry's, which was probably built at the same time. They both had strategic locations. Perry's was located right at the entrance to uh, Montpelier from the uh, West. Perry's is on uh, Route 2. Um, and uh, this one was located uh, along the other entrance. Uh, both of these strategic places to be in. Brigantes was on Route 2, which is a, a location you associate with gas stations. But I just wanted to mention that there were small gas stations scattered around the city. Did you know that you could purchase gas with the dry cleaners? It's now located at the corner of Barry and Main Streets. You could purchase gas around the corner where the laundromat is next to the Catholic Church. There were gas pumps in front of that building, or at least a gas pump. Uh, you could purchase gas where the TD Bank drive-in is now, the corner of State and Main. If you look at that, it does have sort of a garage looking look. That's a totally new building, but you can imagine how a garage filling station could be there. And then we earlier uh, located the, uh, or we noticed the, uh, get the back of the gas station located on uh, the corner of Langdon Street and uh, Elm Street. So gas stations were in uh, many locations around the city. Can I just mention one? Yes, another gas station. Just as you um, head up and not really head up Northfield Street, if you look to your right, yes, there's a concrete where the path from National Life comes down. Yep. That was and there is a there is a photo of that which I didn't put into the slide uh, show tonight, which shows uh, the corner of that uh, that gas gas station. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing that one could fit in there. I know. Was it Emily? I just remember going there. No, I don't, as far as I know, M and M Beverage was not a gas station. It sort of looks like a gas station building, but that was a much larger block called the Tomasi Block, and I don't believe that it had maybe Nuns gas station. Nuns? It was a gas station. Okay, great. Showing my uh, yeah. showing my youth there. <laughs> yeah, it does sort of look like, did sort of look like a gas station. Uh, but I wanted to uh, show you this one, uh, which you probably all recognize, in the corner of Taylor and State Street. Uh, I was just going to note, notice that it was a uh, an attractive gas station in its day. Um, I really like the, uh, the sort of corporate golf design. I had always thought it would be a great spot for sort of a hip sandwich shop with tables out front and the counter inside and you know right next to the pavilion building when state workers used to work in state buildings. I um, thought that would be a great, uh, great spot. Unfortunately, it was torn down and we have what? Parking lot, of course. Okay, this was number 10 on your history hunt. Elm Street. Did anyone get that? Elm Street, yes, that's right. Uh, follows my theme of um, rivers. There is actually a river right back there. Uh, that is the building that's now occupied by Birch Grove Bakery. There's no Birch Grove there, as far as I know. I don't think there ever was. Maybe it should have been called Riverside. 
But whatever the case is, the building still stands. That is the same location. And Paul, I think since the Dennis Lane Mansion is yep. right across from that, that's the building that just got renovated for like three years. Yes. So yep. this is the Dennis Lane Mansion right across the street, with and it's got all the it's they're probably up on it. Yes, yes, the photographer is probably on the building that's the Dennis Lane Mansion. But if you look at this building here, and that yeah. building there, I think it's the same building. It's got aluminum siding, but it's the same building. Okay, so that was, I was just going to tell you, that was the 1938 hurricane, which was huge. Okay, scene number five on your history hunt. Anyone follow the, find this one? Franklin, no. Yeah. It looks like the build that looks like the building that was moved over to Franklin, which is a whole other story which we don't have time for tonight. It is Elm Street, yes. So here is sort of the same location, and zooming in a little bit more. And finally, that's the building from a different angle, but uh, giving it a sympathetic look. Uh, this is 242 Elm Street. Unfortunately, I don't know much about it, but the, um, uh, the National Register nominating papers for Montpelier describes it as a Greek Revival house circa 1840. Also on your quiz, number nine. You must have all gotten that, right? Lane shops, yep, that's probably the easiest one. Um, looks very similar to today. Um, just wanted, since we've got this big screen, uh, just wanted to uh, compare the two photos uh, together. Uh, you can see the brickwork here. It's quite beautiful. It's right there. Uh, the lower building here, still standing. You can see that's the same brickwork there. Uh, so this was, uh, the Lane Company was a manufacturer of sawmills and other cast iron items. Uh, for those of you who are more who are interested in learning more about the Lane Company, the uh, newly revived Montpelier Historical Society will be um, putting in a display in the windows of Walgreens next week on the Lane Company. So uh, be sure to pass by there and take a look at that. And the Historical Society there has a nice model of one of the Lane Shop sawmills, right? Yes, yes. And in the Vermont Historical Society Vermont, in Barrie, sorry. in the lobby, uh, there is a, uh, a little model that someone made of, uh, of one of the uh, one of the sawmills that Lane produced. Okay, this, uh, I just wanted to show you this because it shows an earlier use of the river. Uh, that is where the uh, Lane Shops uh, eventually were built. This is actually the uh, foundry of Alfred Wainwright, which he sold to Dennis Lane in 1863. Um, this photo was taken in 68. Um, we're sort of coming a full circle now from the beginning of the, um, the lecture, uh, because this is the location of the sawmills built by Jacob Davis and his sons when he first arrived here in the late 18th century. Uh, so for you environmental historians, this uh, hillside is also very, uh, very bare. This is not behind the state house, obviously. This is where um, uh, the Catholic cemetery and um, city, yeah, North Street, North Street goes up there. Yeah, yeah, and some of these, it would be interesting to see if these uh, early wood frame uh, houses still stand on uh, North Street or um, Hillhead or uh, one of those. Uh, on the, uh, under the bridge, you can see the waterfall, which is why that nose there. There you go. Under the bridge is the waterfall, right there. So, with those waterfalls, with that dam, that was always there. That's been there for a long time, yeah. Yeah. It was the dam always there. Uh, so, I don't know exactly when the dam was built, but uh, certainly you probably would have. Uh, I don't know if Jacob Davis uh, built a dam or not, but uh, they did at, at some point to power these, uh, these small industries. Is there like a footbridge across there now? Yeah. Yes, yes, there's a footbridge across there now. Are there other dams further upstream on the North Bridge? Yes. Uh, yeah, there, were, there was uh, an industrial uh, operation at uh, Wrightsville. There was uh, a lumbering operation. 
Uh, you can probably tell us more about it. But uh, yeah, before that flood control dam was there, there was, do um, you think of any other locations? Wrightsville? Putnamville. Putnamville, maybe? Was there a, a dam there? Oh, yeah. yeah. There's yep. a small wood dam, like before you get to Cumming Street. So if you're going up the river, okay. there, you know, you've seen the yep. Yep. wood dam and then it crosses the so these were all for fairly small um, industrial operations, uh, you know, mills, small mills. I mean, they were big for our area, uh, but they weren't big mills like you'd have, um, you know, on the Winooski <laughs> further down, or uh, on the Connecticut or the White, or, uh, or certainly further south in the Massachusetts. Uh, just a view of uh, some of the mechanics shops along um, along the North Branch. Um, we saw these a little bit uh, last time. This is a clearer view. And those are some of the same buildings to now, uh, today. I bet some of them are, uh, some of those buildings here are probably covered with aluminum siding uh, right there. And there's a North Max and now there's retaining walls. I don't know what year the retaining walls were built. Uh, that would be an interesting, an interesting uh, topic to research, however. And here, speaking of retaining walls, here's some others. Uh, but now we're turning the corner. We're on the Winooski. Uh, this is Colton Manufacturing it's on the Berlin side of the river. Notice the Red Arch Bridge right there. Uh, and I was thinking, uh, speaking of. Um, other dams on rivers, uh, that this is, I mean, these, this is the furthest upstream on the Winooski that uh, big dam, big uh, industrial buildings are, like this are located, I believe. What is this? This is where the uh, gas stations are today. Cumberland Farms, yes, and Bob Sunoco and the car parks place. Yeah, very different look. And that's what I, I'll show you a map in just a second. One more slide. This is the front of those buildings. Uh, this is what they call Winooski uh, Avenue. I briefly mentioned it earlier. When I said, uh, remember these buildings, when we were looking at the Red Arch Bridge, this is the photo I wanted you to look at. Uh, very nice view with the uh, view of the State House again. Uh, views of the State House are very important in Montpelier. Uh, it really gives you a sense of, sense of place. And this is a detail from 1884 Bird's Eye of Montpelier by George Norris. Uh, so this gives you an idea of what you look, what you're looking at with the industrial buildings on um, uh, Winooski Avenue. Red Arch here, early version of the uh, E.W. Bailey, close pit factory here, the uh, bridges for the. Uh, Central Vermont and Montpelier and Wells River, and of course the Taylor Street Bridge. And then of course all these people boating. I don't know that that really happened. That's a, a rather romantic view. And someone brought up earlier uh, granite and uh, comparison of Barry. Uh, this is a little bit of the area of uh, Montpelier that was uh, devoted to granite sheds. Um, why are there granite sheds in Montpelier instead of Barry? For the simple reason that granite is not carved at the quarries, okay? The quarries, you extract the granite, you have to put the granite onto, well, first you had to put it on wagons, so you didn't want to take them very far. But, once the railroad comes through, you got to put them on a railroad, you can stop in Barry or you can stop in Montpelier. It's really the same. So, uh, for whatever the economic reasons are, maybe land's cheaper, uh, more workforce, whatever, um, it's uh, a granite industry grew up in, in Montpelier, which we often forget. And we often forget that Montpelier did have a significant, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Italian and Spanish population working in the sheds. Uh, Barry had greater numbers of, of immigrants and perhaps a, a wider variety of of immigrant groups, um, but Montpelier can lay claim to uh, to some of that same uh, ethnic diversity um, back in the uh, beginning of the, the 20th century. Paul, well, do you know which one of those is the one that just got fixed up? I don't know exactly, but I think it's one of these two, which look uh, identical. 
let's see. So there's the parking lot here. Yeah. Where the dentist is and stuff, and the turntable for the train. No, nope, this is a different. Yeah. This is a different circle. This is actually a a, a Derek uh, moving granite. So this is a color lithograph postcard. So the it's not as sharp, obviously, as the black and white photographs I've been using. So you probably can't tell from the distance, but this is granite happening here. No, the dentist's office would be down here. That's the modern building. This is the building that's still, it's been taking a long time to um, refurbish. I think the Connor brothers are working on that. Yes. Uh, that building was rebuilt after a fire in the 40s by my maternal grandfather. Oh, really? <laughs> by the name Alejandro of? Alejandro Canis. Canis, okay. Excellent. Uh, so this is uh, Sibley, and so the Italian area of uh, Montpelier would have been um, the uh, Berry Street, the uh, the far end of Berry Street, or most of Berry Street. Yes. Um, where is um, Bar Hill? Would they be part of Bar Hill would be right here in the field. Uh, okay. uh, and the railroad track goes right by there. And there's the rail line that they've uh, resuscitated now and rebuilt uh, other bridges down there. Uh, all sorts of fun things to, um, to explore. The, um, the building at the bottom of, say, of uh, Sibley Street um, was the Italian social club. Um, mm -hmm. It's now called the what block? It's escaping me. Anyone live there? Bianchi, Bianchi block, thank you. Yes, the Bianchi block, which is just off of here. Again, attesting to the uh, uh, Italian population that, uh, that lived in that, that area. Okay, I've got two more images from the history hunt. We're getting close to 8 o'clock. I think we've passed it. Uh, if you've got to go, feel free. I've only got a few more slides. Um, but I wanted to wrap up the, um, the ones on your history hunt. Uh, the, these last two don't have anything to do with my theme of rivers. In fact, both of them are located high on the hills overlooking the rivers. Uh, this is number seven, which is Kinstead, uh, Board of Charities and Probation Shelter Home. Can you figure out where that one is? Top of Main Street. Top of Main Street, yes. Uh, and it's overlooking everything in the city. This is the building now. Um, it's sort of fun to, uh, to compare. Uh, the, the original building is under there. Uh, so see this three-part window here and these two little windows? I believe that's probably the same three-part window. They've removed the little window here, there. I wonder if they didn't move the windows, like that window, to the front. Why waste a good window, right? Move it forward. This is all filled in. You notice the, uh, the, the little dormers or whatever there? Yeah, probably the same thing right there. So that's, uh, that's professional offices now. It used, to, used to be where Necky is. Yes, it's had other names, uh, but it was, the, uh, it was Kinstead at one point. Green Mountain School, I think I heard someone say at one point. Um, other one uh, that has nothing to do with rivers is uh, number six on your sheet. This is Heaton Hospital. Uh, this was the city's hospital. Um, and it's on Seminary Hill, what's called Seminary Hill, overlooking the city. Um, fun facts before I show you what it is now. Uh, Homer Heaton was the, uh, the businessman who gave money for this, uh, this hospital. And he lived down on where? State Street, right? That's where all the, the business people lived. He lived on State Street in a home that was where the location of where Union Mutual is located now, which was the neighboring house to George Blanchard, um, which we saw in the, uh, the ribbon cutting uh, picture for uh, Billy Bypass. So all the industrial li uh, leaders lived down there on State Street. This is a, uh, another photograph of the same building. It's somewhat expanded. Uh, they now have an expansion pavilion on the side. And this is Heaton Woods, the same building. It's a, an architectural mess at this point. <laughs> um, it's very hard to tell where the front of the building was. But I believe you are looking at the front of the building 
behind this big white wall. I think that is the front of the building. Uh, there's not much left of it, but uh, center window there, uh, dormer here. What about the granite foundation? Does it match up? I don't know. Uh, that's not going to be the granite foundation. This is an extension of the building. But I think that this is the front of the building because uh, this would have overlooked uh, Montpelier. Um, the, uh, this pavilion has been totally removed. This cute little pavilion here is now this big block uh, of the building, which was added in 1952. Uh, notice anything similar to the uh, high school in 1956? <laughs> sort of looks like the same architectural style. Uh, oh, and the craziest thing is that this building is all brick, right? That is a wood frame building. But I suspect that it's the same building, which gives credence to my idea that uh, the Brigantes Sacconi station is under uh, Parker's quick stop now. Uh, Do you have a picture of the front of the building with a big porch? That's where we used to walk in back when I was born or shortly after. Okay, so I was going to comment on this, which seems to be uh, an attempt to make the front on the back of the building. Um, but now, it's, I think it's the back of the building, again, uh, because you can't enter here. Uh, they put this nice little, they've done the best they can with this building. They've got a very nice little um, garden here, sitting area. Uh, but uh, I mean, these columns suggest an entrance, uh, but you can't enter there. Back so, in the day when it was a hospital, that's where you entered. Is that where you entered? Yeah, okay. all your information and stuff. At the Excellent. Yep, it certainly looks like that to me, and that's what I would try to do if I were walking by. But um, I don't think it's going to work uh, work today. Where is that building? This is uh, Heaton, uh, Heaton Avenue, which is off of Woodrow, which is off of College. Uh, Liberty. It's Liberty. Yeah. It's uh, it's a rounded street that links <laughs> Liberty to uh, to College. It actually changes name in the middle of the street, which is very confusing. Okay, finally, I would be remiss not to mention the power of the river to destroy human-made structures. Uh, we already saw one photo of the um, the 27 flood, uh, but Montpelier was plagued by periodic floods uh, until the massive <coughs> were culminating in the uh, 1927 flood and then the eventual construction of flood control dams further upstream and around the state. This is just one of the many, many, many photographs of the 1927 flood of Montpelier. Uh, this is, of course, is Spring Street. This building is still standing. It's now um, uh, business offices. This is Elm Street right here, not far from where the mystery photo was. The mystery photo is a little down there. You probably recognize this house uh, by the entrance to Public Park. Very beautiful uh, shingle style house. Yep. And look at the height of the water on this building. Can you imagine? It uh, probably flooded the second floor. I'm not sure that the second floor um, uh, escaped uh, damage there. There was, there was a, I grew up in that neighborhood, and the house across the street, which still stands, the Gleason house, that family was said to have spent that night in the attic because their second floor is flooded. Yeah, so trying to get above the second floor, if you can imagine. Well, I live a little bit further down. Yep. A little bit lower, and I found the flood in my... You still so find flood on the floor. On the second floor, in the, uh, in the cavities of the, of the walls? Yep, because yep. they probably didn't tear it out the way we would now, although they may have. This is, a, uh, this is an interesting map uh, to show you just the... Um, how widespread the flooding was in, in Montpelier. Uh, so uh, this is uh, Main Street here, Elm Street. There's a little area, high area of Elm Street, uh, right? If you do walking in Elm Street, you know there's a little uh, little bump there. So it, the houses there uh, survived the flood or escaped the flood. Uh, the Granite Street Bridge was down here, so the I'm sure the forces on it were not as strong as the forces here on. Um, the North Branch, or the uh, the Taylor Street Bridge that was taken down. 
So I've got just one final slide for you and a uh, sort of a long quote. I hope you'll bear with me. Um, this is a uh, beautiful shot of the construction of the interstate in the 1950s. Um, and you can see a couple of the themes here. You can see the railroad tracks and the roads. And you can see the supports of the uh, coming interstate. Uh, and you also see the Dog River, which we have ignored up until this point today. Because uh, it doesn't really, um, doesn't really form the built environment for, for Montpelier, although it's part, obviously, of the natural environment. Um, but the quote I wanted to uh, read to you is from Timothy Dwight, who is president of Yale University and a respected religious leader. He came to Montpelier in 1806, okay, so right at the very beginning. He couldn't see this future that we're seeing here today, and he was not impressed with Montpelier's future prospects. <laughs> he clearly understood the relationship between the natural and built environments, but he didn't think Montpelier had much going for him. So this is what he said, and this is just a small quote from a much larger description. Montpelier is situated at the confluence of two headwaters of the Onion River. The valley is here large enough to contain a village of perhaps 30 or 40 houses within a regional vicinity. The hills, which are high and sudden, approach so near to the river as to form a defile rather than an open valley. The legislature of Vermont has lately fixed upon this spot as the permanent seat of government. The determination is obviously unwise <laughs> and, must, and must have resulted from very limited or very prejudiced views. He then goes on to say that the capital should be located in a large and, if possible, a commercial town with, quote, improved manners, extensive information, and acknowledged respectability. Then he goes on to say, by the association of ideas, which is so prominent a characteristic of the human mind, a little town in the seat of government will always impart its littleness to the legislature. <laughs> so hopefully we are no longer imparting our littleness to the legislature and that we've actually uh, flourished in this uh, cycling valley. Thank you all for coming.